the complexes, and uh, uh, I'm Brom Basford, and this is uh, the yes, night that we hear about the future uh, from G. No, no, uh, uh, Robert F. <laughs> Jennings. In that case, we'll hear from our speaker, Robert Jennings. Thank you. Well, I, uh, I want to thank you for having me, and uh, uh, I'll tell you, as he said, I should uh, fill you in a little on who I am. Uh, I, I have been active uh, for a number of years in the uh, uh, World Future Society, although I, in recent, I haven't made the last two conventions. They had their convention, by the way, in July down at the Sheridan. They have, uh, every third year, they have it in Washington, D.C., and it's usually a little bit bigger because that's their headquarters. Um, they, they have a monthly magazine, uh, The Futurist, and they also have a special publication for uh, professional futurists because, uh, like at every convention or every convention they have, they have like three or four days with speakers, and then they have a day afterward just dedicated to the professional futurists because there are a number of, uh, and hopefully uh, I'll get it. Now, I want to apologize, I didn't make a special uh, preparation in, in, in terms of the PowerPoint for this. I'm using one that I did for the Henry George School, but it does uh, covers a lot of the the kind of the, the background of what futurism is and how they operate and what uh, what they do. So uh, I'll uh, I'll start off here and hopefully we'll get this going. So just uh, don't don't let the uh, Georges. Uh, to upset you. Uh, now all I want to do. Yes. Cheese quesadillas okay. or chicken? <laughs> Just so quesadillas. that's, this is really, uh, Anything to drink? Yeah, well, we can say this is a case study. I'm going to use the Henry George School as a, an example of uh, how you might, if you were studying futurist ideas, well, how you might apply it. Now, let's see this. Here we go. Uh, this is, uh, one, one of the things they call it is uh, uh, foresight. And why, uh, and why didn't they see it coming? I know it. <laughs> there, there's a lot of these uh, people uh, uh, wonder, you know, when the when the big uh, the, the uh, subprime mortgage thing, you know, blew up. Uh, why they didn't see it coming? And uh, so that's one of the things. So there, there are a few people that did, and they are, they they never fail to remind you that they were one of the people that knew what was going to happen. Uh, you know, among other things, this uh, helps uh, cope with uh, foreseeable problems in, in disrupting changes. Uh, it most motivates people uh, to work for preferred futures because sometimes you project uh, in the future some some bad, you know, some pretty bad outcomes. So if you uh, oh, oh. Keep doing the same thing and expect a different result. Wait a minute. Very smart. I want it. Do it over and over and over. And we're going to get a stick now. Yeah, okay. Well, anyway, uh, yeah, well, it reduces unpleasant surprises. And it, sometimes it aids in more realistic planning. And, of course, uh, hopefully it will reduce some frustration and anxiety. Uh, what is futurism about? Well, it's commonly known as, you know, heads up, uh, wake up call, foresight, vision. And it was popularized by uh, the first, I think the first big movement in this area was Alvin Topso's Future Shock. And, uh, and that's what really was the, the impetus that got the, the, the movement started. The World Future Society was formed to systematize and uh, professionalize the practices of uh, futures. And then I got a, so this is my own extemporaneous take on futurism, but if we go back history, there were, you know, oracles. Uh, if you read, if you're a student of religious history or have, you know, you're a Bible reader, uh, you, the, the uh, Jewish scriptures have these tales of these prophets who were, uh, uh, well, they were really more social critics than they were uh, 
projecting the future, although they would, the wrong check. they would um, usually tell you, you know, that they could see that the way things were going, it, it was not going to be good. <laughs> now, augury in, uh, among the Romans and some of the other civilizations, they uh, somehow used birds uh, in one form or another to uh, try to predict the future. And now, horrorous is where they, uh, <laughs> I think the Romans used this a lot. They would kill a goat and then look at the entrails. They would have this guy to try to figure out. You know, we still do that at home. That. <laughs> and then, uh, well, then we have astrology, and that was, uh, 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 of course, looking at the stars uh, and, and saying that these uh, various planets would influence our life, especially around. Uh, the time we were born, <coughs> and uh, oh, there's my shamans are, of course, in uh, a lot of uh, primitive cultures. They yeah. were uh, kind of holy men or healers or whatever they were, and, and, and they seemed to have vision. And there were seers. And of course, in the last uh, century, there were some famous people who used to have these uh, people who get together and use a Ouija board yeah. or. Uh, they would have seances where they could talk to your dearly beloved departed and so on. They, they proposed to, and then of course you get one of the perennial things that we all <laughs> try to forecast and, or wonder and want, want some help is uh, meteorology, the weather. We're always yeah. trying to figure out what the weather's going to be. Mm -hmm. And one of the, uh, the old, uh, in, the, in the farmer's almanac, they, they, they don't just try to predict uh, Two or three days ago, they looked. They were trying to find things that uh, would uh, project what the whole season was going to be like by looking at things, you know, like animals. A certain they get sometimes if they, the animals seem to sense when something's going to come on, and uh, they would try to read those. And of course, there were. Uh, there's always those five-year plans, that <laughs> especially under uh, communism. We knew a lot about that, and then. Uh, the U.S. Geological Survey is uh, is always trying to find some way to uh, predict when we're going to have earthquakes, which is a pretty uh, well. Uh, at least now they're at the point where they have enough sensors around the globe that uh, if there is a big earthquake, they can at least warn uh, a possible tsunami. Now, uh, now, what methods do the futurists use? They use uh, extrapolation. I mean, that's the first thing. I mean, that's the old business plan. Is that, well, we had X, we sold X amount of goods this month. It was up five percent. We'll project that it's going to go up five percent the next month. Now, the Delphi method. You know, Delphi was one of the oracles. That that was from the Greek. Uh, and I'll tell you, there's a man that used that a lot. But it's basically. Uh, you send out a survey to a number of experts in a certain field, like uh, uh, technology or medicine or education, and then ask these questions about what they foresee coming down. And then you uh, pool and try to synthesize their opinions and come up with some uh, predictions of what's going to happen. Usually these, uh, yeah, five years is uh, about as far out as you can hope to get any kind of uh, realistic projections, because once you get off to 10 years, it's it's harder to uh, see that far in the future. Uh, scenarios are, uh, uh oh, just a minute, let me just. Wow. Yeah, keep yeah, doing it, keep doing it. It's going to work different. Uh, the scenarios are, are, are good, and I'll, I'll go with the last slide I'll have is a, goes into more detail on that. Uh, and uh, market surveys and consumer trends, uh, that's another area. And there, there's a lot of, all, usually at every futures conference, there's always someone talking about innovation and creativity. And, uh, then there's scientific trends, you know, what's going to happen with computers or with uh, portable, all these portable devices we have now. Uh, 
Well, a big thing going on right now is big data. And this is, uh, uh, you know, real-time uh, feedback. I mean, now they're doing things now uh, where they're analyzing data as it's being collected, you know, within, within minutes. I mean, when I first started in programming, uh, businesses were happy if they could get reliable uh, quarterly reports. And then they started to go to monthly. Now, now they, they want to know uh, uh, minute by minute what's happening out in the, in the marketplace. Uh, in demographic analysis, uh, they've always had, quite often they have people there, which is uh, by looking at different cohorts like baby boomers or the Generation Y, Generation X, and so on. And uh, they have certain characteristics that you can predict. Now, Harry S. Dent is one of the... Uh, the guy who has really championed this uh, technique the most. Uh, of course, you're all familiar with the uh, Center for Disease Control in Atlanta, the epidemiology that's trying to de detect uh, the spread of flu or, or any kind of uh, sickness. And uh, well, then there's uh, some computer models, and, and there's some, uh, especially in the economics, they'd like to make. Uh, computer models to try to uh, project where the economy is going. And, uh, well, I guess co cosmology is the, the SETI, that, uh, the search for extraterrestrial intelligence is uh, kind of like that. And then, this is one of my favorites. I was, I majored in social sciences in college, in, uh, in psychology in particular, and this uh, is about, uh, Memes and it's the social memes. This Claire Graves, and I, will, I, I don't know if we'll get to him yet, but he was the one that he was one of the early founders of the World Future Society, and it was uh, coming out of his thinking that his uh, um, uh, what do you call him disciples wrote wrote this theory, elaborated on this theory, and they color coded it, and they are showing how societies or groups of people go through these predictable stages as they move along. And, uh, of course, science fiction, and we're all familiar with that, that uh, these guys, uh, you know, often years ahead of something happening, and it actually, some of the things they wrote about, which were con considered purely imaginary, actually uh, come true. Uh, well, now, there's also, um, because of this, the World Future Society, probably more than anything else, there are now a number of uh, academic programs in uh, future studies. Uh, and of course, there's a, there's a religious futurist, you know, trying to figure out where uh, religious thinking is going, or not going. Going to hell. Uh, human potential, there's always a few people who feel uh, that, uh, you know, the whole the whole future depends on uh, what we think about and how we uh, get in touch with uh, something or other, different things like that. And, uh, and of course, education is there. We, we're, we, we're always tinkering with education, trying to get it to be more efficient. Right now, I think it's, it's kind of halfway in a crisis. Uh, and, oh, and every, uh, just about every year, if you go to the Futures Conference, you'll find some group that has new, some new take on management styles, you know, whether it's team, teams or, uh, you know, analyzing, uh, getting, the, you know, the right people in the right spots and, and, and all different kinds of theory. And then, of course, there's, a, there's usually, at a conference, there's usually some, uh, people with an interest in police work and crime and where that's going. Uh, now here are some famous and current uh, practitioners, at least a couple of years ago they were, well some of these go way back to you, you everyone's heard of Nostradamus I'm sure, and Edgar Cayce, and then there's uh, John Edwards crossing over, he was on TV for a while, I haven't heard, seen him for a long, long time now. Yeah. Now we're getting into the people, here's a big guy in uh, Washington, D.C., Joseph Coates, he's a real curmudgeon. Uh, he was a general government thing. Uh, David Pierce Snyder uh, liked statistical trends. 
Uh, he used to work for the uh, Census Bureau. <laughs> you can imagine that, why that comes natural to him. Uh, Marvin Citron was interested in the military and government. Uh, I remember one conference where, uh, before anyone had hardly heard, heard, heard of uh, uh, terrorism, he was predicting that we would have all this terrorism going on because of all of these uh, unemployed young males in the, yeah. some of these uh, third world countries, you know, that were just, uh, uh, had nothing else to do but get in trouble. <laughs> Uh, and now here we, uh, Peter Bishop is, uh, uh, started one of the first uh, futurist academic programs at, uh, uh, down in uh, Houston. Uh, and Clement Bezold, he's just a, uh, I don't know what he did in favor, I think he wrote a big encyclopedia of futurism, among other things. Now here's one of my favorite uh, futurists, is uh, Edie Weiner and her partner Arnold Brown. Uh, they're out of New York City. And they, they, they like to look at consumer trends, you know, what uh, fashion, et cetera. Uh, but they're very good, they're, and, and they're very entertaining, and so on. Uh, and here's one of the uh, <laughs> consciousness people, Barbara Mark Hubbard from California, and she, uh, you know, feels that, well, she's concerned about world peace, and that we have to all meditate and so on and get in touch with the, uh, the, the, uh, the great world force, uh, and, then, and then we'll solve all the problems. Well, here, William Halal, at, uh, he likes the Delphi method, and he usually at a conference, he'll have uh, the results of one of his surveys on a certain area. Uh, he teaches, I think, at Washington University in, or in, in Washington, D.C. Here, this guy is not really not active much anymore, but uh, I like him as Walter Truett Anderson. He was on identity and psychology. Uh, there was an institute out in the San Francisco Bay Area that he was with. Uh, here is uh, Rick Smyer, Communities of the Future. Um, I don't know if he's in, from Black. I think he's from Blacksburg, uh, you know, Virginia, where the Virginia Tech is. And uh, he, he, they, well, they, they champion things like uh, city paid for internet so everyone can get on the internet so you can kind of try to create, you know, communicate more with the citizens and get more of a sense of community. And then Gary Marks, uh, he's a, uh, was a big futurist on uh, trends in both primary and secondary education. Uh, well, this is, I won't go into this too much. This was just some points I was trying to show how we might use the futurist thing to promote the uh, Georgia's movement, like, uh, so on. I'll, I'll skip over that now, but to here. Now, this is the last big slide I'll cover right now, uh, and then I'll go into some other things. Uh, do it again, do it again. This is a, a breakdown of the, one of the favorite tools of, of uh, futurist scenarios. And one of the benefits of scenarios is that you take, it's kind of a broader, it may be focused on a certain area, but you, you try to uh, uh, look at all of the factors that might influence what's going to happen. Uh, these are possible future states of the system and environment. They are based on assumptions about trends and the impact of future uh, developments of technology, society, etc. They are big picture views taking into account numerous variables and stakeholder interest in their interactions. Uh, and they start looking at, at current reality as a baseline, and then they have several alternative scenarios that are usually developed. For instance, they're both desirable and undesirable outcomes. Uh, at least some of them require specific human intervention or action to achieve. Uh, the focus is on an area of interest in a future time frame for the realization that may include ongoing changes, trends, as much supporting data as available should be used. Uh, and black songs are uh, usually not included, but they are always a caveat, meaning there's always a warning. So that's, uh, I, uh, this is a, the end. I'm not gonna go into this one. There, that, so that's the, uh, the end of that, of my presentation here. Uh, so we don't need to scream anymore? Yeah, okay, let's see. And then I will. Thank you.
shut it down. Not my bash on my own, but I'll, I'll shut it down. Uh, now I'll get into some of my kind of ad living stuff here on uh, various uh, aspects of futurism. Uh, well, we just mentioned the last item there was black swans, which are usually not considered in um, scenario building. Uh, and, I, and that brings to mind, uh, uh, I heard I, just not too long ago, there was this meteorite that exploded over Selyavinsk, Russia, and it, and it knocked out windows uh, like over 200 square miles and caused quite a lot of injuries, mostly from glass stuff like that. So those are the, that, that's sometimes Georgians call that, or I mean there's features, things that come out of the blue that you, it's hard to predict. Um, in one of my scientists, scientific journals or the book I read, Technology Review, Discover and uh, Wire, in one of those there was a man talking about, uh, he was able to uh, he could have, if he had gotten enough money, they would have developed their surveillance of asteroids and, and stuff uh, enough that he could have given them a warning. You know, it would be nice, even if, you know, if you can warn people three or four hours before one of these things happens, you could maybe, uh, they could prepare. It's like preparing for a, a tornado. You know, if you get the warning enough time, you can get into the, a safer place. And, uh, and then he said, in the future, there are there is actually plans to deploy a more powerful satellite-based uh, system to surveil for asteroids of a very down to rel relatively small sizes. And uh, again, uh, the main the main hope is that at least you can get an early warning. Uh, if you want to really get into the future, then there's this the, the possibility of uh, of uh, deflecting these, you know, where we would actually send up a space vehicle that could bump, nudge this asteroid into another orbit, another path, and avoid a collision with uh, Earth altogether. In that regard, I, I saw something that, that kind of made me laugh in a way that, um, you know, in World War II, the Germans developed first the V-1 rocket. It was kind of like a, it was kind of like a drone, but it uh, it was not controlled. Well, once it got launched, it, it was it, its path was fixed. So when the the, Air, the Allied Air Force found out that they could fly along one of these things, and since they had no uh, internal controls except that they were going, you know, some straight line they could bump their wings and they would crash. <laughs> so that's what we're going to try to do uh, with the asteroids coming into Earth is uh, bump their wings or nudge them so they go go somewhere else. But, by the way, in that scenario, I actually when I do that at the Interior School, at that point I, I have a, uh, the, the uh, World Future Society they don't do video recording, but they do audio record every presentation, and it's a like they have like eight or ten concurrent sessions every time slot, and they have like four or five time slots a day. And anyway, this one guy was uh, talking about a scenario building for some uh, agency. He's a Canadian, and he's working with the UN on water, world water resources, and. Uh, and, his, and so he was explaining how they built their scenario. And uh, they, they had three future scenarios. Number one, doing his business as usual. And then there would be a lot of suffering, especially in third world countries, where, where they, their water resources are, 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 are diminishing and are being contaminated and so on. Uh, and then another um, scenario was if the government spent money and then certain players would benefit more than others and then the final scenario was where the grassroots where people would uh, help alleviate water shortage and water problems just by modifying their behavior one full at a time all right <laughs> but okay
Yeah. Well, anyway, yeah. Um, for the future. Right. Yeah. <laughs> uh, well, one of the other uh, uh, things that uh, futurists worry about are, uh, especially if, if when you're talking to uh, the business community, is uh, destructive. Uh, uh, not destructive technology. All right, guys. Uh, uh, <laughs> I lost the, the word. The, you know, in, technologies that disrupt things. Uh, disruptive technology. Uh, I brought along a little sample here to see if you remember uh, recent history. <laughs> Uh, there was a company that was at the top of its game. It had a, a, a huge market share of the portable music industry. And I was at the uh, either the uh, blues festival or the jazz festival, and they had a tent there, and I went in and I, and I bought one of their mini disc players. Uh -huh. And here are the mini discs that you wear. And you could... Uh, you could plug this into your PC and download music and write it out on these mini discs, and then you could play them on here. Uh, does anyone know who the company was and what happened? It was Sony. Yeah. And they got outstretched, I think, by uh, the uh, portable MP3 players. Yeah, the iPods. Yeah, the iPods came out. No, not the iPods. It was the uh, actually the MP3 players oh, MP3. that came out before the iPods. Yeah. I should know because I worked at Newman and we had over 500,000 of those things sitting in our warehouse that we were trying to get rid of. Oh, yeah, okay. <laughs> wow. Well, anyway, that's, uh, that's one of the reasons that uh, uh, the um, people in business are well advised to have somebody uh, doing some kind of futurist uh, thinking just to try to anticipate any disruptive technologies or unusual new developments. Even like, I mean, for one or two years, we had experts on peak oil. Well, you know what happened to that? What happened to that? They developed this uh, newer technology of fracking and so on, and, uh, and better methods of seismographic uh, you know, detection of oil deposits. So apparently we, have, uh, we aren't going to run out for a while. Um, one of the other, there's another example I got of uh, uh, futurism. As there's a, I get emails from a guy by the name of John Maudlin, M-A-U-L-D-I-N. He's uh, uh, kind of an international financial advisor. Well, every year he gets invited to a one-week uh, thing at the Naval War College in Newport, Rhode Island, and it's the office of that assessment for the Department of Defense. And he and a lot of other experts get together and try to give the Department of Defense uh, projections of where different things going on in the world, you know, from um, so on. Uh, well, I, now I'm going to bring up one other thing, I guess, before I get into questions, and that is uh, uh, this summer I went to. Uh, should I talk longer? <laughs> you can if you want. Well, a little bit. I, but this is a. Uh, I already heard someone talking about this uh, tonight. Um, I, I was with my daughter on a trip. We went to the Grand Canyon, and then we drove down to Phoenix. It was 119 degrees. <laughs> we got down feet. Well, one of the days we were we were down there for five days. So I, one of the days I, I got them to go up to this colony I had visited many years ago, Arcosanti. Have you ever heard of Arcosanti? Oh yeah, yeah. 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 That bullshit. 90, 90 miles north of uh, God damn it. of yeah. Phoenix. It's built on the banks of the. Agua Fria River, and at this, that, this time of the year, the Agua Fria ri River is a dry riverbed, uh, as uh, many of the streams out in Arizona are. Uh, Paulo Soleri was the man who did this. He, yeah. he, he became a student of Frank Lloyd Wright at Taliesin West in Phoenix, and then he split away from him and went up and tried to build an <coughs> experimental colony there. 
And he has the, the beginning of it, and they, uh, there's about 100 people there, but he had envisioned uh, 5,000 people. Well, his vision was what he called linear cities. Linear cities would have a very minimal footprint. They would not disrupt the, uh, the environment, the very lowest impact on the environment. They would be multi-storied, they would be self-contained, they would have no cars, uh, public transportation, you'd have housing, schools, retail, work, everything all bundled together. That was his, he felt that this, the way we were going was unsustainable and uh, that's uh, another story, <laughs> I guess, because uh, if you go out around Phoenix now, it's unbelievable how they're, how the sprawl goes around miles and miles around Phoenix. Um, I think that's everything that I can think of right away, so. Uh, Why don't you give us your predictions for the next 10 or 50 years? Oh. Since you're in a world futurist society, right. tell us what the future is going to be like. Well, if you believe Harry S. Stem, uh, we're going to go back into a, a severe recession because the baby boomers are retiring. They're going to they're 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 no longer saving. They're they're drawing down on their their investments, so the stock market is going to suffer and so on, and that we're going into a deflationary period. And the housing has another big drop. Now, I don't know they're, uh, I mean, these are all very plausible reasons. Now, the, what, the thing that I worry most about in the future is, um, because of this urban sprawl, one of my other things is, uh, I have gone to the American farmland. We're losing farmland. Uh, a, a lot. And by the way, I just finished reading uh, Jared Diamond's Collapse. It's been out for a few years. But anyway, in there, uh, he says that in every of the failed civilizations he looked at, that deforestation and loss of soil fertility were, were factors in the, the, the collapse of these societies. And of course, he says, uh, the way to mitigate those problems is that uh, you can either have a top-down, uh, like, you know, approach to solve the problem, or you have a bottom-up. And he gives examples of both. In fact, one of the ones is the uh, Dominican Republic, which is on the same island with Haiti, but there's a world of difference. And part of it was the guy that was a top-down guy that made all these national forest preserves and. And, and, and would uh, have have loggers, illegal loggers, shot and killed. Uh, was a dictator, <laughs> and yet he did uh, he did good. Whereas over in Haiti, <coughs> where the, the the native people throughout the, the the French presence and try to build their own economy, they ended up uh, deforesting their land. They have no trees left. They have a soil erosion. They have a uh, and then, they, of course, they had that terrible uh, earthquake, wasn't it? Yeah. So they're uh, they're struggling. Um, so I, I'm predicting that we're going to have to go. I mean, to a period where we're going to have. We already have man, uh, starvation in a lot of parts of the world, but I think we're going to, in the next 10 or 15 years, we're going to have uh, food shortages that will really start to wake people up. To, to, that we have to treat the planet more. I was going to say, in the futurist, I, I've i never seen a, an environmentalist, I don't think, per se, even though this, but this guy with the water scenarios was kind of in that area. But I mean, I think that's one of the, right now you have all these scenarios of doomsday scenarios about uh, how global warming is going to destroy uh, much, the earth. And then some people say it's man cause, and others say these are just normal cycles of uh, solar cycles and other the, the way the planet, by the the way the sun it goes around and the earth goes around the sun, that in effect the weather. But um, uh, okay. I I don't know. Uh, uh, I mean, one of the things that's not very good 
that really says that we're going to have, uh, maybe even in this country, uh, a, a lot of rioting, is this wealth divide. This wealth divide is, is, uh, is not good. And uh, I don't know what we can do about it. Uh, uh, but it, I think it has to be addressed or, or, or we're going to have a lot of social unrest. So that's my... All right. I see that David has his hand up already. All right, David. Are you familiar with a novel by a man named Robert Silverfer called The World Is Can you speak up? Uh, no, I'm not, yeah. In that, in that novel, Mr. Silverfer presents what life would be like according to his vision in one of, uh, he doesn't mention Paulo Soleri by name. Yeah. But in one of his, one of his cities. One place. of his names is, yeah. I, I wonder, you know, um, well, people are willing to live in these high-rise condominiums, but would they be willing to live in a structure where, you know, all the stuff gets mixed in there, I'm wondering, you know, because people, a lot of people want to live out, out in the country somewhere, you know, out in the, with nature and so on. But Solieri's idea was that, yeah, that's nice to be near nature, but let's not destroy it with our cities. Let's build a, a linear city minimal footprint, and now everyone can go out in the countryside and enjoy uh, nature. That's what we need, highways to get to them. Yeah, right. <laughs> or something, right. What's the name of the top of the list? The world inside. Okay, right here. And, and that two, the two kind of macro things that yeah. I'd like to get your comments on. The first one is uh, the internet, because I, I read a book by Eric Schmidt with the Google He's come out with uh, the forecast and what fascinating things are, things are going to happen on the internet in the next two years. Yeah. The second one that's very interesting is biotechnology. What's fascinating is, are you guys aware of a company called Silera Genomics? It's called Silera Genomics. There's a guy called Craig Venter who, whose team kind of decoded the human, human genome. Yeah, right. What that company right now is doing artificial life, what they're doing is right now, in the lab, they can create artificial bacteria. Complete, complete your specifications. Now, if you look at it down the road, I mean, these two kind of trends, internet, words, and mm -hmm. uh, biotech, what would what, what you, what you have you come across in these future mm -hmm. meetings? Well, that's, I know that there are um, some people who take comfort in uh, where technologies, especially biotech, is going because they feel that uh, technology will solve all of our problems. Of course, that's what we, but every time technology solves a problem, it usually creates more problems, you know. So, um, I don't know. But by the way, if you want, I, there was a, a quick thing I wanted to throw in, uh, I forgot earlier, about, um, you know, what, some of these new technologies to come out. And this, uh, David Pierce Snyder was favorite topic of his. He gave the example of the PC. Well, the PC first came out, quite a few people got them, and they, and they projected that, you know, it was going to be increase in productivity. It was going to reduce paperwork. Well, you know what happened? We got more and more paper. We got these high-speed printers. We printed up mountains of paper. And uh, there was really no traction. There was no improving in productivity until something happened. You know what that was? The Internet. Once you paired the computer with the Internet, then you... You gave it, you put it on steroids, and away it went, yeah. Then you started to get really productivity greens. Uh, yeah, I, I, yeah, there's some, because there's some people that, for instance, uh, are trying to uh, convert sawgrass and other uh, plant, you know, lower, lower class plants into ethanol or, or some kind of energy, yeah. And so some people are hoping that's going to happen, and... Um, yeah, it's. Uh, uh, I remember uh, a superologist some years ago uh, who was talking about uh, participatory democracy, uh, replacing the uh, uh, voting once in a while. Uh, well, I I know that. Um, 
Yeah, at one of the conferences, there was a girl who was very optimistic of predicting that uh, democracy was taking over in many of the third world countries, and we're going to get better, uh, more humane living. But now, now you've got you know spectacles like Egypt and Syria and so on, which is, are not too uh, uh, promising. Well, we don't know yet. Yeah, right. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Ah, okay. The John Edwards that you mentioned, is that the same John Edwards who was once a, sen a nor senator from North Carolina and who ran for president no. twice? Well, John Edwards was, uh, no, no, not the, not the candidate. John, this is John Edwards, the, uh, what, what, was the, what was the name of his, uh, uh, he had a radio show where he, he could have people in the audience and he claimed that he could connect with their pet. Passed on relatives. Oh, oh yeah. you mean he was a medium? A psychic. Medium, yeah, right. Yeah. A psychic. Right. Okay. Well, you know, uh, I, you know where I live. I live on Desplaines Avenue, and right across the, the street is uh, Forest Home Cemetery. Oh, Did you know that the Forest Home Cemetery is the only place you can cross over the Desplaines River? <laughs> they have a bridge in the middle. <laughs> really? <laughs> right. Oh, okay. <laughs> oh, okay. Uh, you know, uh, two and a half years ago or so, we had the Arab Spring, and I happened to be in Egypt at the time, and of course I was totally blindsided. I didn't see it coming, and I didn't feel lonely. Did some futurists uh, make a good prediction there? Uh, I don't know. Uh, I, I'm, I'm sure that some uh, some of them did uh, saw that coming. Uh, maybe Marvin Citron. Uh, uh, I don't know who else might have saw that coming. Yeah, it was. Uh, well, I know that uh, I get these emails from uh, different people, and uh, there was this. You know, we were worried about. Uh, Saddam Hussein and some of these people in the Middle East, because they, they felt we were worried they were going to come and attack us. Well, this guy, I think it was Myron King or uh, another guy, he says, don't, he says, there's a, something that's brewing, that's been brewing for thousands of years, hundreds of years, and it's going to explode. And he, he was talking about the uh, Sunni Shiite divide in, in Islam. And they're going to, they're going to, and they, you know, that, the Sunnis control most of the oil and the big resources. The Shiites are are more uh, a different group, and they're they're usually uh, get the short end of things. And so those two, and they're clashing. That's what you're seeing now. That's what's happening in Egypt, and what's happening in Syria, and what happened in Iraq, and to some extent what happens in the, in, in Afghanistan. Thank you. Well, there's a guy right behind him here. Oh, uh, John they let you get away with. We were afraid Iraq was going to attack them. How many people in this room believe Iraq was going to attack us? Nobody believes that. You shouldn't no. say things like that. No, but I mean, but the idea was, well, Iran, or they, we, I mean, or at least Israel was worried that Iraq might attack them, or Iran. And uh, yeah, but I mean, the idea was we didn't foresee. That they were their worst enemy. They're going to attack each other, which oh, is what's happened. That's well, uh, well, what Saddam Hussein was uh, the Sunni uh, prince of uh, yeah. Iraq. Uh, there was a war between uh, Iraq and Iraq. Yeah, right. That, uh, the United Nations did not intervene. Yeah, you know, yeah, <laughs> yeah. That was a very bitter war. Yeah, right. Uh, United States sort of back. We back Saddam. Saddam, yeah, right. Well, uh, so you're, you're thinking about uh, the, uh, the Sunnis and the Shia are yeah. all two true. Mm -hmm. uh, that's what's providing Syria. Uh, all right, uh, Charles. Would you recommend if anybody owned the who owns a car that they sell it right away before they become worthless? 
Now I have hearing aids and I couldn't quite understand oh. everything you said there. Would you recommend that anybody who owns a car that they sell it right away because they're the worthless? <laughs> uh, well, I would certainly uh, not encourage people. I have a car and I, I know I've got to spend put some more money in it. Actually, car. Actually, you would probably be better served. And myself, I think I would be better served to get rid of my sell my car and just rent one of those uh, smart cars when I needed a car to get around. Because you know, between ins you know the cost of insurance, the cost of upkeep, the cost of gas. That's it's it's a very expensive uh, indulgence. But I, uh, well, I, well, all I can tell you is that when I went to visit my son in California, in, he lives in Los Altos, which is in the Silicon Valley. Uh, both he and his wife worked for Biotex, and they both bought uh, Teslas this 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 summer or this spring. So they drive Teslas, and they they say they figured that they both had long commutes to their jobs, and. Um, they, they, they figure they save about five hundred dollars a month in gas. Uh, well, yes. Uh, uh, so if you're going to get uh, get rid of your car, uh, trade it in for an electric car. Are you ready to Yeah. Uh, a noted futurist uh, by the name of First Wild. I forget his first name exactly. Uh, he predicts that um, the uh, cyborgs or human cyborg uh, hybrids will take over the world by 2040. Oh, uh, one of them. Okay. That? Wait, wait, wait. Can I just say one of them already did? His name's Dick Cheney. <laughs> <laughs> well, I would say uh, the people that are good at that are these uh, uh, science fiction furtures <laughs> who are, you know, they, they envision cyborgs. Well, I'm I'm on I'm part on my way. You know, I had uh, cataract surgery, so I have uh, implanted uh, lenses, and uh, I had both of my hips replaced. All the body. Right. So I'm I'm getting there. <laughs> well, they're they're doing. I mean, like now they're uh, they're getting many prostheses for things like. Uh, uh, implanting stuff in your brain less invasively where they can actually control very more specific parts of your brain. Uh, well, there's a big, you know, there's a national project now on uh, the brain. They're going to try to unravel how the brain works and how we, or just how, do, how are we conscious? No, no, no psychologist really understands where consciousness arises. Right. Uh, right, Kevin. Do you believe um, someday people will be voting through mobile technology? Um, <laughs> once they get a, a a thumbprint or a fingerprint on there, or some other you know real strong security, I, people won't trust it. I mean, in fact, now now they got this uh, thing that's uh, it's kind of a joke. It's a way to disenfranchise people by demanding that they come with a, a picture ID when they vote. Now, and, and, and a lot of... It's gotta be a picture of a white person. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, yeah, so if you, I mean, I would see if, once they get the, the technology secure enough, then, then, I, then I think it will be. Because right now there's a, there's a big concern about fraud on mobile fraud between, because people are hacking phones and stuff like that. So it is something that we're working on as a party, just so everybody knows, if you want to check out the platform, it's called the Altruist Party. And I'm collaborating with um, friends and, and other eight members in Florida and elsewhere. Yeah. But the, um, you're talking about bio recognition, right? So we're yeah. going to have a two-way bio recognition, yeah. fingerprint, optical, anything that the person would want. Um, they could even have an option to do uh, uh, age uh, validation, anything like yeah, right, that. Yeah. But the main thing is that it's non-profit. Yeah, and right, it's yeah. set up per state. So Illinois would employ its own people to maintain its system. Right, and yeah. by sources. So that's something that we're working on if you're yeah. interested. Well, if you can go to a Bears preseason game like I did Thursday night, and you give the guy your ticket, and all he does is scan it and gives a ticket back to you, you know, they, they got, they, there's a... They, they think they, they can prevent people. Establishing it for the people. 
you know, people exactly. getting counterfeit tickets or reusing the same ticket more than once. Because yeah. before they used to tear it off, so you couldn't use it again. Now they don't. They don't bother. They just scan it. Yeah. I I guess those things must communicate with each other or go to database or something. Because they got yeah. You have IP. There's so many more ways yeah. to validate that it took place with yeah. in person than paper. So the security and technology is there. It's just the people going after it as and yeah. holding it as their idea. And that's what we're trying to do is time date time stamp it for the people rather than parties. He can tell us. Uh, he can tell us. Okay, Claire. Okay, Kevin, I, w I need to, talk to give you this information about how they vote in Venezuela, and it's much more transparent than our way. But anyway, on the topic on hand, um, considering the fact that Fukushima uh, is on the, the radioactive waste is uncontrollably uh, going into the Pacific Ocean and also going down. Uh, traveling across the west coast of America, yeah. and continuing and considering the fact that scientists have estimated that fracking eventually results in contaminated water. So, how long do you think do we have before we have made our agriculture and our fishing industry um, on edible? Uh. Well, that's a big concern, and I certainly think uh, Jared Diamond in Collapse, you know, points out how fisheries have collapsed, how we polluted the oceans, how we, he was a big one, he's very hard against hard, what he calls hard rock mining, because they, not only do they take the trailings out and dump, dump them in, uh, on the landscape, but they use chemicals and stuff that leach into the groundwater and into streams, and uh, yeah, it's, uh, and even farming, I, I was born and raised on a farm, but a lot of farmers are uh, using excessive amounts of fertilizer and pesticides and herbicides, and that's not good uh, in the long run. And uh, yeah, if you once your soil fertility goes, you're in big trouble. <laughs> you know, because you you got to you know that's one thing we know we got to eat. If we if we don't have food, we're not going to last very Is that you're serving it? That's enough, right? Uh, come on now, guys. Play nice. <coughs> whatever, ha whatever happened to the future that was envisioned 50 years ago with the flying cars and the monorails? <laughs> well, there are a few monorails. Um, and I don't know if you know Bill Went. Bill Went, yeah, he used to come here. He's a big advocate of the monorail to replace uh, our system out here. Uh, and there was a futurist, and we had a local chapter who came. You actually, they had actually had a company where they were going to make uh, individual pods that were like could hold up to four or five people, and they would go. Uh, they were like monorail pods. That they, the idea was that they would there would be a, a main track going around, and then these pods would come in to a station and be available. You'd get in the pod and you'd poke in your destination, and you would go up, and you wouldn't stop until you got to your destination. Those are called people movers. Yeah, right. So that was, uh, but that's never, that's a little, I don't think that you can carry the volume of people you, you need during the rush hour on those things. My college campuses. Yeah, right, yeah. So that, uh, well, it would be nice if we could get, uh, but flying cars, I don't know, I, that's a ways off, I think. <laughs> right, Jim Bolger? Yeah. Give us your thoughts on Thomas Friedman's book, The World is Flat. I, I don't know that book. I've never read it. Yeah. How about Thomas P. M. Barnett? Hmm? No. <laughs> uh, you're you're better read than I am. I guess. I read the science magazines and articles in there, but. Um, Thomas P. M. Barnett and Thomas Friedman both predict a wonderful future for mankind by the expansion of globalization and by the uh, increasing amount of development around the world. And their main contention is that as people develop, the population goes down, as development goes up, but it's going to require some sustainable energy. Can you comment, please? Um, well, I, I'm a Georgist, and, uh, and uh, Georgists have always held that uh, uh, the, the cure for poverty is not, you know, depopula not population control, it's giving people opportunity. 
uh, uh, so uh, that's certainly true, but um, and, 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 the, and, and and we do have a problem if the population gets much bigger. I mean, we did finally have one Georgist, a very respected man who taught ethics um, at Auburn University, uh, and he, he wrote a book uh, called The Tragedy of the Commons, and then he eventually came out and said that that, that the Georgists have got to consider uh, population control because the, the care and capacity of the earth is, can only hold so many people, even, even in the most optimistic cases. Um, well, I, I think, uh, well, that, I mean, that's true. If, if we, the Georgists believe that if we could develop some of these poor countries, then uh, their, their, pop, their population growth would go down. But uh, we already, but, but look at Europe. Europe's uh, below reproduction, re, reproduction level. You know, Italy, all, a lot of those countries, uh, and Japan, too. Uh, they're, and they're, they're not booming. <laughs> Even though their population is going down, uh, so that's 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 a conundrum. Uh, All right. Yes, Charles. Yeah, are we headed towards one world government? We're already there, Charles. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we are. That's called the United States. Well. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> That's an interesting question. I mean, there are there are. Um, well, I ran into one of these uh, Occupy Wall Street people the other day, and they had a flyer saying that uh, that that we've got to you know we got to have a new government. I mean, this this government is just uh, non-functional. You know, Washington meaning the national government. We got to go back down and to the grassroots and build up a better thing. Uh, well, one of the forces that you've got a lot of multinational corporations, which are almost like bigger than a lot of countries. So that's a force that will tend to uh, homogenize the world and get. And maybe we would come up with a. It's hard to believe, you know, because of the uh, all of the disparate beliefs, you know, uh, just religious beliefs or different ideas about economics, how we could all get together on the same page. But I mean, I think, well, in the long run, it pro we probably will. Right. I remember, if you would ask me this a few years ago, I would have told you, yes, just go to the church unity active. When we get all people to join the Catholic Church, they will have peace and prosperity everywhere. <laughs> uh, uh, I'm a fish lover. Uh, one world is coming. Yeah. And uh, the vagrants may not love me, but uh, I'm disappointed by both. Uh, fish farming seems to pollute the area that is being farmed, and uh, apparently uh, you have to leave it alone for several years before it's suitable for uh, oh, fish farming again. Uh, what is the prospect for uh, seafood? Well, it's, um, there's, uh, there are more, okay, there are more and more uh, people trying to get restaurants, et cetera, consumers to pledge to only buy sustainably harvested fish, you know. Because a lot of times these people go in and they just plunder and decimate the uh, the fishery, and then it, and it collapses because there's not enough young fish coming up. Uh, all I know is in that regard, and I don't know all the details, but you've heard of the the preppers, right? The people who who feel uh, we're going to have Armageddon here, and the society is going to fall apart, all of our infrastructure is going to blow up, and so on. And uh, there's one man that has this system that you can buy. He has all the parts and all the stuff you need. You have a big fish tank, and you grow these fish that grow pretty fast, and they got a lot of protein. You take their droppings and put it on your plants, and you grow vegetables and stuff. And, the, and somehow in the water gets recycled so it's clean. And uh, and you can, according to him, you know, you can go two or three years 
in this little self-contained system and survive. Because that's what he envisions, you know, you may, you may have to be entirely on your own uh, in a case of a, a total collapse of society. Are we going to be eating algae? I don't know. But so I don't know what about fish farms. I know that there's a problem with the droppings of the fish and maybe some of the stuff they put in there. I think some of the time, because you get all these fish in there, they, they get parasites and stuff, so they put chemicals in there. And, and I don't know, maybe they'll come up with a more sustainable fish farming. Hopefully, if they can get sustainable ocean fishing, maybe they can get sustainable fish farms. Well. I'm good enough for it anyway. Okay. <laughs> Thank you, Matt. Uh, Thank you. If we're at the end of our question here, Charles. Okay. In the future, will anybody go to church? <laughs> uh, I don't. I think church um, is a uh, because uh, a church, besides having you know this other world theology and other exotic stuff. Um, is also a social phenomenon, so I think some people will still um, go to churches, because I'm thinking of uh, what they used to call the uh, Christian fellowship. A lot of the Protestant churches were small, and they were kind of self-contained, and they, they missed, you know, they actually helped each other out, you know, it was a social thing. Um, well, I, I, I sometimes get very vexed at, uh, at um, organized religion. Yeah, I think they... Uh, uh, they're a, they're more of an impediment <laughs> than a, a help. But, uh, but at the same time, people that have faith are usually healthier and, and survive better than people that, uh, that maybe they don't, don't have. Sin. That true? That's not true. That one's true. Okay. Yeah, you all yeah, sin. They pick it up from somewhere. Stay out all night. No, as far as I know, the only people that are afraid to die. People of faith. Yeah. <laughs> they fear death. No. Well, not How about these uh, suicide bombers? They, they, they don't fear death. They, they you know, believe they're going to go. They're going to go up with Allah and no, no, twenty no. virgins and holy cow. Talk to the old people you know. I still don't know about that. Don't talk about suicide bombers. You don't know enough about it. Yeah, right. You don't know enough. Should we? Uh, uh, we'll have to move to our rebuttal okay. period. All right, okay. let's thank our speaker. Right. Yeah. Right. Right. One world right. government, no one goes to the All right. Can you change my number? Thank you so much. Okay. Uh, how many uh, communications for the rest of us? Short area, though. Something to say to the rest of us. Uh, Alex? Uh, Travis? About eight to ten minutes, Prom. 20 minutes each. We can go about ten minutes. Six minutes. Uh, let's make it. Yeah, let's, let's get six. Six, six more minutes people. maximum. After six okay. minutes, you're trespassing on somebody else's time. Okay. Okay. And the first lucky speaker is Frank Aguilar. Is the speaker around? He just went to the bathroom. He went to the bathroom because. Uh, and this is one of the poorest presentations we have here. <laughs> Excuse me, sir. You know, it is my turn. Yes, this was a very, very poor presentation. Uh, I was very interested in here what the, this society of futuristic society had to say, and he didn't say anything, nothing. Uh, she mentioned names of people who were in different organizations, nothing. Now, uh, here he is. I think your presentation was very poor, uh, very un, un enlightening, and. Uh, so um, I am very disappointed. It's not the worst we have seen here, as you may know, but it was very, very poor. Um, as far as to 
trying to find solutions to the food supply by fishing in the sea is really a total naughtiness. The sea is dying. The sea is dying. By 2050, probably there will be nothing to collect from the sea. Today, the Japanese have developed methodology to vacuum the little creatures that uh, they are the base of the food chain in the sea. Creatures that they are about a centimeter long. And they have developed methodology to put big funnels and drag them through the sea. And on the end of the funnel, they have a vacuum cleaner that sucks the water, filters the these, these little creatures. This is to continue trying to feed people that keep growing in number and demanding more and more. Um, as, as far as Arcosanti, which I was there, and the similarity between Arcosanti and the nuclear power plant was that when I questioned, how do you, this Arcosanti was incredible. In the mountain, they have built in caves, they have built this nice rooms and things, and there were a bunch of idiots living there. And uh, how do you feed yourself? Where do you grow the food? How do you bring the water up there? Oh, well, it's going to come by. So uh, they, were, they were totally unaware or incapable or what to say, how do you live in there? How do you build cities in the side of a mountain where you don't have no way to grow your food or to get your water or to dispose of your garbage? It was bullshit. Now, how they how they sustained themselves was by building a smelting little bells of different sizes that are that that uh, Solari have designed. That architect little bells that then they sell to the tourists who pass by there. Bullshit. Not sustainable. Um, as far as to farm laws, oh, connected to, to, to the Zion power plant. I went to visit the Zion power plant at about the same time, and in both places they kicked me out. Because I asked questions, I said, how do you get the food? How do you? And they kicked me out. Oh, just like and that. in Zion, I said, well, what about the water? Why don't they kick uh, me out? So you couldn't ask questions to these people who have this this uh, ideology, the faith, you know, don't ask the priest uh, how, how you're going to, uh, you know, go up there and, uh, well, you are dangerous, don't ask them. Uh, uh, yeah, growing fish farms, fish farm. can you imagine the naughtiness of all that? You are, you are not only that the, the sea is not sustaining the natural life on the sea, but One now minute, you introduce, pardon? One minute. You're introducing the, these, these foreign things in there that you have to maintain, as I mentioned, with probably antibiotics and probably, and then these fish do escape into the wild and they affect the wild if there is something that is still living there. We are fucking up our environment. We are destroying our earth. And uh, they mentioned Fukushima. The government of Japan have said just past, past week it will take 40 years minimum for them to be able to isolate what's going on in there. In the meantime, every day, thousands of tons of radioactive water are going into the sea. That's a pretty dim future. Yeah. You got a positive? Are you positive? I think he's positively Absolutely. negative. Absolutely. But they admitted it. I mean, uh, it's a crisis. Thanks a lot, uh, Bob. Uh, that made me uh, think a lot. And uh, I did read, like you did, that book collapse. I'll have to look back on it. Uh, it's interesting, though. Uh, some of the books that tell me most about the future are about the past. Uh, it's so old cliche, uh, 
the past is prologue. Uh, a lot of it you can find by reading history. And it's uh, amazing how many things we miss. In spite of uh, history, uh, we probably should have seen the Arab Spring coming. I mean, it uh, uh, was evident to a few people uh, the big depression in 1929, not to mention the one we just are in, but the one in 1929, people should have seen that coming. It happened again and again. They just avoided it by, by somebody running in there and putting money in the stock market. Uh, but they should have seen that uh, coming. Now, I don't know about the flu epidemic in 1918. I don't know if they should have seen that one uh, coming or not, but certainly most of those uh, things, there were things coming along. Another one, I'm reading the book, uh, I saw the DVD about the Dust Bowl. And boy, we should have seen that one coming. Uh, there were people who said this might happen, and uh, people totally ignored what they had to say, and uh, we had a big mess. Uh, so, you know, uh, all these kind of things, you would think that we, we would uh, see that coming. Prohibition. Jeez, uh, these, we should have seen that, that coming, that that would not succeed, but evidently we didn't see that either. So uh, uh, maybe we ought to read some more history. Thank you. I'm Michael Cooley. The future is here. We're living in the future. About a month ago, I said, we're living through the end of the world. And we are. This is it. We're at the end. The only thing about the future that's going to be different than today is the future is going to be bleak. And I'm being very optimistic when I use that word. <laughs> Charlie mentioned one world government. I said it's here already. Realistically, it is, because we now have a one-world economy. Any person, any company, any country can perform any service or manufacture any product and try to sell it to anywhere else in the world. There's merchandise traveling all over the world on ships and airplanes, and it's going from $5 a day countries to what used to be $30 a day countries that are now quickly approaching $20 a day countries and on their way to 10 excuse me, excuse me, excuse me. Merchandise is going from $5 a day countries to countries that used to be $30 an hour countries and are now about $20 an hour countries and are quickly on their way to becoming $10 an hour countries and it will be worse from there in the succeeding years. Major trade, major trends in the world. China has over a billion people, India has over a billion people, and other countries in that part of the world, Japan, Korea, Philippines, Indonesia, Malaysia, and down to Southeast Asia, Vietnam, Cambodia, Thailand, Bangladesh. There's about three billion people living in that part of the world, and a lot of people are living pretty well but maybe as many as over one billion people are living on five bucks a day. Think of that, one billion people. Their life would really improve if they got a pay raise to $10 a day. They think they were on easy street. And they're the ones that are knocking on the door of the United States. They ain't saying, hey, I want to come here, I want to be an illegal alien or any kind of illegal alien. All they're saying is, hey, send us your jobs. We'll perform your services and we'll manufacture your merchandise. And we'll ship it back to you. That's nice. <laughs> the thing that's keeping this country's economy afloat right now is the fact 
that the Federal Reserve Board, the Federal Reserve Bank is printing money. They aren't actually having printing presses printing $100 million bills. It's all done by computer. The Federal Reserve has told us that they're printing $1 trillion a year. That's what they admit to. They print $1 trillion a year and give it to the United States government to spread around here and there wherever the government spreads money around. <coughs> That's the only thing that is keeping this country out of abject poverty, which would lead to abject civil disruption. Also, printing all that money is leading to, not leading to inflation, is leading to horrible inflation. Right now this country is in the midst of serious inflation and we are really are heading toward severe, severe inflation. Another major trend that exists in the world is eternal war. The human race has had wars ever since Cain killed Abel. But wars would come and go. War would start up here, last for five years, and then it'd start up over there, last for five years, and then there'd be periods of five or ten years where there weren't any big wars that we heard about. But now we have eternal war. It is not meant to end. There are lots of people making trillions of dollars off war. Also, it causes a lot of disruption. People aren't worried about what's being done to them. All they're worried about is trying to survive because a lot of horrible things are being done to them. They aren't worried about blaming this guy or that guy, the Republicans or the Democrats. They aren't worried about blaming faceless people here and there that run the world. They're trying to make enough money to buy food and keep a roof over their house. All right. As far as all, all well, time already? Okay. Six minutes, yeah. One thing about the food, the situation in this world, there's plenty of food in this world, except there's lots of food in one place and not much food in the other places. If you think of it, Frank mentioned, and it's true, the oceans can't grow enough fish. Think of that. The oceans can't grow enough fish to meet the demand for fish. People are dreaming of fish farms to grow fish in ponds in the south because the oceans cannot grow, Mother Nature can't grow enough fish for people who want to eat fish. The other thing, in this country, every year we take mountains of corn and we set it on fire and burn it up. Approximately 40% of the corn crop in the United States is turned into ethanol, which we put into our gas tanks and burn up. Anyway, that's all I got, thank you. All right. All right. All right. Um, Okay, uh, I just wanted to, uh, uh, this is an interesting presentation, it wasn't exactly what I expected, but um, I do want to, I did have a few comments I wanted to make. First of all, um, first of all, when you, in your presentation, when you, your list of predictors, you, you mentioned the, the old five-year plan of the Soviet Union. Well, this was not really a prediction like the other predictors, it was a plan. You know, prediction is when you, is, is when you, not when you're saying what should happen, what you're saying what you think will happen is through a natural process. And a plan is something very different. That's when you say, okay, this is, these are our goals. Uh, by, by next year we want to be here. And then by the year after that we want to be here. Government agencies do this, corporations do this, uh, even individuals do this. And that's not the same thing as trying to predict. Um, the future, because then you're trying to you're trying to make predictions about about forces or processes over which you personally do not believe yourself to have any control. Uh, now, um, now I'll, I'll get back to that in a minute. But now there's a few other points I would have to differ. You you talked about um, about global warming and you treated it like like there was um, like this was a matter that scientists are disagreeing about. It isn't. Uh, about now, global warming is a topic of climatology. About 99% of climatologists agree on certain points. Number one, carbon dioxide, CO2, causes a greenhouse effect. It warms the atmosphere. The more CO2 there is in the atmosphere, the warmer it gets. Number two, 
It is an incontrovertible fact, and there's more carbon dioxide in the atmosphere than there has ever been in any time that, for which we have a record over the last several hundred thousand years. Number three, the, for the last 150 years, uh, the average temperature of the Earth has been going up, and it still is. So, unfortunately, uh, global warming denialists like the, uh, the Heartland Institute right here in Chicago have succeeded in bamboozling people, in, in, in fooling them into thinking that, that there's some kind of controversy. Well, gee, I don't know. I mean, this side here says that, 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 that global warming is, is real, and this side over here says it isn't. And so, gee, I don't know. Maybe the truth is somewhere in between. You know, who knows? Uh, and, and unfortunately, the news media are complicit in this because they pick up they pick up press releases from, from these global warming denialist groups, which get heavy funding from the oil industry. And, and then they, they get into this little game where they give equal weight to both sides. So let's say if a reputable scientist over on this side are saying this is happening, and some, some screwball nut job over on this side is paid off by the oil companies is saying this is happening, well, I guess, in the interest of being fair and balanced, we have to give equal weight to both sides, right? Now, okay, now, uh, one other thing I, I would also like to just address briefly, the Sunni-Shiite conflict in the Islamic world. First of all, the Sunni-Shiite uh, divide has absolutely nothing to do with Egypt because there are no Shiites to speak of there. Second, uh, the Sunni-Shiite conflict in Iraq did not first emerge after the U.S. conquest of that country in 2003. The first time there was a civil war in Iraq between the Sunnis and the Shiites was in 1991, when Saddam Hussein was still in power. It was in the immediate aftermath of the Persian Gulf War and is one of those forgotten episodes of history. Uh, and Brahm asked in the Q&A session whether we would eat algae. Well, we already are. Because uh, because right now you can go into a you can go into a store here in Chicago and buy edible seaweed, which is a form of algae. Um, second, now I a gentleman who was he's not in the room anymore, but he was making a generalization about atheists uh, fearing death less than religious people. Um, I wouldn't make generalizations about um, about there being no uh, uh, about there being no Christians in the foxholes. Uh, so, now, I mean, I, I think there, that there are atheists who fear death, and there are religious people who fear death, and there are atheists who don't fear death, and there are religious people who don't fear death. You know, I wouldn't make generalizations about that kind of thing. Now, on the question of predictions, um, I used to be a big fan of predictions of the future. I read Marvin Cetron's book, Encounters with the Future, back in the 80s when I was in high school. I, uh, I read John Naisbitt's book, Megatrends, uh, I, uh, uh, and, and, and so I was really into this sort of thing. And these guys have a hit rate roughly equivalent to that of psychics and, and uh, religious prophets. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and, and so uh, people tend to, through confirmation bias, people tend to remember their successful hits uh, and forget the predictions they made that didn't come true. And, and that causes people to think, wow, that guy was really on the money because, because he got a hit sometimes. And, and I don't really believe in predictions of the future now. Uh, for one thing, I don't believe that the future is written. I don't think there's anything inevitable about anything. I think the future is really what we make it. I don't, so rather than talking about predictions, although I am not a communist, I would rather talk about plans. What's our plan? And uh, that's all I have to say on the subject. Oh, um, that's right. Um, that's right, although I am not a communist. Kind of, yeah. <laughs> you know, um, I too, like the first speaker said, uh, I, I expected something different about a question of futurist. Now, to me, just to start off by way of defining, the future is about, uh, about time, you know? So time can be measured in various lengths. We can talk about minutes, days, weeks, years, decades, but 
I, I would note this. As mankind as a, as a race, as a species, has developed its intellect, we have thought along longer time periods. Now we think in millions and billions of years. So the future for me is millions and perhaps even billions of years. Our sun is said to, to, to survive for 12 billion years. Now, we ourselves as individuals, we might live for another 50, 60 years, but I tell you, in the real future, I myself and all of you are dead, okay? The real question is, does life, does mankind still exist in this so-called future? Now, science would say that we are determined and predetermined by the laws that govern this universe. Okay? Now, the second law of thermodynamics basically says that the universe is running down. That energy always goes to a less and less ordered state of existence. What does that mean? That means that eventually our sun will burn out. That means that all but the stars in our galaxy will burn out. That means that we, unless we as a species, determine how to really think about the future and try to exist for the future, not these little petty things that I've heard discussed, you know, like what happened yesterday, what's going to happen tomorrow. That's not the future. Ask the Neanderthal man about the future. Ask the dinosaur about the future. You know? The real future is, do we, can we, will we exist as a species? My life is nothing. The race is everything. Because all of life is nothing more than permutation and combination. That's all. We are nothing more than permutations and combinations of the genes that have been passed on to us. And we use that which we have, which is our intellect. The only thing that separates us from a stone or a blade of grass is our minds. Now, what do I see for the future? One gleaming thing that I see for the future that can possibly impact the true future, it just slowly is creeping on the scene. And that's Obama's mind-brain mapping uh, uh, program. <clears throat> Just as they map the human genome, they are trying to start, because it's, 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 it's a monumental task, because still, even on the conceptual level, the scientists that are, that are dealing with neurology and, and neurophysics, and bio, they haven't even got their minds around how to really frame the question of what it is they're truly seeking. But oh my goodness, this is the future of, of mankind, because at some point in time, we've got to talk about getting off of this planet. We've got to talk about stabilizing a, 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 a space exploration. Science fiction is nothing more than visionaries' thoughts, because thought does not develop in a linear motion. If nothing more, we have come to know that, that, that the whole universe operates by Combination, uh, 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 the, the word that I'm looking for is mutation. Mutation spurts a, a, a different type of, of change that is, that is non-linear. So, so as we develop techniques to harness the mentality that we have, and the internet is one, as I've heard it said, because now you are collectivizing the, the collective intelligence of our species and we all have access to it. And the kind of, of production of, of concepts that are truly visionary and that that has a potential to, to make available for us as people in this era, it, to me, is phenomenal, you know? So, to make it short and brief and clean, for me, the real question is, do we exist, you know? We can pretend that we exist right now because we seem to be living in this time, but how long do we really have the wars, the, the, the foolishness and the folly that we are still engaged in? These are just like our, our imbecilic little nephew who should be locked up in the basement. You know what I'm saying? But yet, he's, still up, he's out there on the world stage causing problems to all of us, for all of us. Will we live? 
or will we die? To me, it's based upon our intelligence. How do we marshal that which is our true resource, our minds? Thank you. Good evening. Uh, well, I heard a presentation about the future that didn't say a whole lot. And I heard talk about global warming and uh, running out of food. Most everything I've heard this evening has been very bleak about our future. As I see it, life supposedly started somewhere in Africa or somewhere around the Middle East. And if you look at the natural progression of man, human beings have spread themselves more or less evenly over the entire globe. And the natural progression is that man will continue to go forward only into the heavens. I believe by 2020, man will have walked on Mars. That's only seven years from now. I believe by 2050, man will, be, will have colonized Mars. I believe that uh, resources will be brought back here, needed resources will be brought back here from other planets by us. And I think that in time, the Earth will become much better, not much worse. We've gone through a lot of very bad things, but I think that things will begin to get better as we do the rough work on other planets and we begin making our own home planet a better place. And that's all that I have to say. Thank you. All right. You're going to volunteer to live on the moon? <laughs> Mars. Uh, Mars. Mars. <laughs> As I recall from Ray Bradbury's The Martian Chronicles, the Martians didn't necessarily like being colonized. Um, the only things really that I have to say are concerned. Pablo Soleri's Archaeology uh, and his Arcosanti. I'm not in a position to disagree with Frank uh, as to the merit or, or the lack of it concerning Mr. Solari's ideas. I will only say that shortly after the Museum of Contemporary Art first opened in its original building back in the 60s, they had an exhibit that dealt with Paolo Solari and, and his uh, futuristic cities. And I found it quite interesting at the time. But that, was, that was 45 years ago. And what validity it has in today's world, I do not know. I will say also that I mentioned earlier Robert Silverberg's novel, The World Inside. That painted a portrait, and a grim one, of what life in such a community might be like, in which mankind or humanity lives in a, lives in a constellation of skyscrapers in various places, with uh, each floor a, a different city. Uh, there's very little democracy in such a place. And um, exit out there, well, you can get out, but if you try to get back in, you're treated as something that has to be sterilized and destroyed. Uh, they didn't want anybody going outside and coming back in with something that might mess up their city. And it seemed kind of like also uh, the skyscrapers were also uh, a caste-ridden society. The higher you went up, the higher place in society you had. The, people who ran the place living in Louisville, which was the top floor of the, of the skyscraper. So Silverberg painted a pretty grim picture in his book. And how, whether that really applies to what Solari came up with, I have no idea. Thank you.
find it quite ironic that a presenter and a person of the world future society would not know a name like Thomas L. Friedman and the world is flat because his monumental book or series of books tended to wrap up the trends of the last 20 or so years in the form of technology. I ask you, sir, which is a better date, 11-9-89 or 9-11-01? Which to you struck more importance? What are the dates again? 11-9-89 and 9-11-01. Probably 9-11-01. Actually, it was 11-9-89. Why? Even though they say a lot happened on 9-11-01, 11-9-89 was when the windows came, when the windows went up and the walls came a tumbling down. We had the Berlin Wall falling and the introduction of the Windows operating system for PCs, which were two of the largest major trends of the last 20 years. 1996, the development of the Netscape Internet Browser. We've all seen what's happened with the bringing in of Facebook and Twitter and some of the other social media. We've also seen a larger world get interconnected through the development of fiber optic cable that was laid by now bankrupt companies like Global Crossing and many other things happening. And what many people fail to realize is that the world will be getting a lot more connected, will be getting a lot more closer, and will be getting a lot more of a community than we even see today. Thomas Friedman in his book talks about the steroids, the cell phones, the uh, social media, this type of thing that's going to cause rapid social change. Now, I'm going to try to give you in the next two to three minutes the biggest demographic changes that we're going to be seeing in the next hundred years or so. The first one is the aging of the population around the world. When a country reaches a mid-cap of about $7,000 per year, people have less children. And this is a fairly straightforward concept. Children are looked more upon as a source of labor in underdeveloped countries when you, when, when you have them, you, they're helping on the farm. But as you, get, as you get more money, children get to be an expense. Even though you love them, they are a pain in the ass sometimes. It costs over a quarter of a million dollars to raise one. One's nice, two are nice, but not eight, not nine. The development of family planning and other things that may given families a choice as to if they have children or not. The second major development that's going to be bringing the best and most peace to the world will be the expansion of globalization. We're finally, finally beginning to see the development of Africa. We're finally beginning to see the development of the Central Asian Republics under a modern economic system. That means the providing of an adequate food supply, the development of electric power, and the integration of those countries into a world-class communication system. Those three bring more people together and cause more change than any other radical point you may have. Frank, as far as the environment's concerned, I think we're going to clean up the world for our own best interest. And frankly, I don't see us having a potential energy crisis. In two weeks, we're going to be talking about something called the molten salt thorium reactor, which is a different kind of a nuclear power, where the reactor is based on a science of, more, of, of flowing molten salt rather than this light water pressurized reactor that we have now. And the potential of these reactors, to be, they can be made the size of a truck and be basically made safe, has the potential to really power the world for the next 5,000 years. There is so much thorium in the ground right now that it's, it's basically, we don't know what to do with it. And once we can harness it as an energy source, we have an end to our water problem, we have an end to our, our, our we have an end because of the process heat, we can make fuel, 
from other things, and there's a ton of globe game-changing technologies coming down the pipeline. One of the other things that you guys may not realize is the development of nano computing and other, other items. Yes, a lot of this stuff can be weaponized, but at the same time, the same technology can also be used for the betterment of mankind. So, with the development of people prospering and the decline of population, the expansion of globalization, the expansion and integration of electric power communications in an adequate food supply, and the simple fact that we will find a good, solid energy source, the infrastructure's in. Folks, we haven't seen anything yet. Thank you. Wait until we get all the thorium, that'll, that'll ring true. You haven't seen anything yet. <laughs> We're all gonna die. <laughs> all right, that'll be eclectic as usual. First of all, let me thank you. Bob, that was really good. Nice scenario. I, I should bring this back in the past. Many, many, many years ago, we did have someone who spoke from the World Future Society. Uh, his primary emphasis was he had this seaweed kind of stuff that he claimed if you ate this, this only thing he would eat. And he was aiming to live 800 years. <laughs> it was sort of like, it wasn't bad, it was like, like, a, like a chip dip. I don't know if I could go, you know, on it three times a day or anything, you know. I don't know if that'd be worth it. Anyhow. Are you still alive? No. <laughs> we lost touch. Uh, by the way, the World Future Society, you, you can subscribe to their emails, which I get uh, once a week or so. I must say I don't read them assiduously, but you can sign up for it. Uh, another thing, in the past, I did get training as a librarian. And a lot of people don't realize one of the things we learned as librarians were statistics and learning trends, especially business research, oriented type research. The Department of Commerce actually produces a voluminous amount of information on trends. He talked about it lightly. But uh, the business community is always looking towards the future and wanting indications not only for product development and sales to investment and things like that. It's really, it's really the, the cutting edge of what they do. Uh, let's see here, I covered that. Um, the other thing I was gonna say regarding um, mankind in the past, intellectually, especially in the Middle Ages, did not have any concepts of the future. Um, I spoke here on the calendar one time, so I had to look into this, but people lived, oh, each year was the only thing they emphasized, and the seasons were more important. Most individuals in society, at least in Western society, I know for certain, could not tell you what year it was. They could not tell you their age. And the reason for that was, was that in theology, the only event that was, the world, God created the world, it was static, and it didn't change. And the only thing that was gonna happen was, was the end of the world, the second coming this book of revelations kind of thing. So they really didn't, I mean, there were for certain individuals, uh, certainly in government who did keep, you know, check of the years and things like that. But the average person did not care about the future. That's why they, they didn't change. That's why someone is, it, it, someone is called the dark ages. Uh, because they said, this is just the way it is. God created the world. And uh, they didn't have any orientation towards that. Uh, let's see, all right, I covered that. Um, what was the other thing I was going to talk about? Let me think here a minute. Um, okay. 
Uh, the last thing I, I, I'd like to talk, oh, I just want to mention, you mentioned they're the prophets predicting the future. Lois got me this videotape to watch and learn about the prophets. And I must say that like one was crazier than the next, sort of like, <laughs> like you guys. <laughs> I said, these guys, these, these guys are telling the future. I mean, you got to steer clear of that. But anyhow, thinking about the future, I was in Disneyland about two weeks ago. <laughs> and I only had a day. Uh, it was only giving it a day. And I actually only went to one exhibit. I went to, I went to the one on land. I must admit, I took even the walking tour of that. But the only other thing I went to was in Tomorrowland. I went to Tomorrowland, and they have their oldest exhibit called the Carousel of Progress. Oh yeah, oh yeah. And it was built for the 1964 World's Fair. And Disney designed this himself personally. And I guess they liked it so much, if you want, it's the original, I guess you could say it's the original and oldest attraction in the park, in Epcot Center. And I went to it, and the one thing about this thing, they covered the 20th century, the technology. It was basically the use of electricity and in the course of the 20th century, but they have little acts. I think it's five acts all together. At the end of which they sing this, it was even, the lyrics were even in my guidebook. They sing this stupid song yeah. that says, there'll be a great, big, beautiful tomorrow. Yeah. And it's starting every day. <laughs> and you, at the end of it, the whole audience starts singing the stupid song. Yeah. <laughs> but if you get to yeah. Disneyland, yeah. <laughs> that's the only thing I went to. It's so corny, it's great, but yeah. it's positive. There's a great big beautiful tomorrow, folks. Yeah. <laughs> he reminded me of, uh, I went to the World's Fair in Flushing, New York. And at the fair, they had a thing, General Motors had an exhibit called Futurama. Yeah. And when you came out, they gave you a little pin that said, I have seen the future. A little <laughs> while later, New Yorker Magazine had a picture of a businessman with a suit and hat on, and this little pin, I have seen the future. <laughs> you know what happened to GM, right? <laughs> Well, uh, I was most intrigued by that list of uh, predictors, okay, that you had, and I really take issue with the inclusion of Nostradamus in any serious discussion, okay, because Nostradamus didn't figure anything out. If you believe in Nostradamus, what he was given was revelatory knowledge. He did not gaze in the future and say, this and this and this. He gazed, he was given a vision of the future. He did not deduce one, okay? So I have, that's a problem with me, the Nostradamus. Uh, if uh, anybody brings that up, I have a problem with, that, with credibility with that person. Second off, I want to talk about a person who was not on your list because he was dead. You only talked about living ones, okay? To me, one of the greatest prophets of modernity was writing 50 years ago, and that gentleman's name was a mad, crazy Canadian called Marshall McLuhan. Okay, and uh, while well, I read Marshall McLuhan, and um, I first encountered him in journalism school, and the journalism professors were saying, you gotta do this, uh, he's the cutting edge of uh, media criticism, and we got this the hot medium and cold, cool media, and it turned out to be, well, that part of his legacy to me was uh, to be cut, put a kind of, kind of bullshit, okay? But the other half of his legacy to me was pure gold. He started talking about the nature of modernity. And modernity, the nature of modernity is determined by the nature of technology. And technology has phases, okay? When man starts creating technology, he's extending his body. For instance, uh, to hunt for a rabbit, let's say, you want to hit, well, you try to grab one, right? Uh, that works, I guess, you know, up to a point, but then man discovered the use of a stick to extend himself, hit the rabbit, okay? Uh, then uh, that's an extension. Simple tools, manual tools, okay? And then man discovered mechanization. And the first stage of mechanization is through muscle power. Personal power like a spinning wheel, 
plowing a field or using a horse, a mule, a donkey, or an ox, okay? And the next step came mechanization through external power, all right? Steam engines, gasoline engines, water wheels, what have you, okay? Then the next leap would be electrification. Now, following this uh, development of technology was how I developed my talk in China in the, alph in the no alphabet hypothesis. And the part that I really couldn't, didn't have time to really talk about was how China caught up. And how China, before even how China got caught up, how China fell behind. China's culture could not adapt to these various phases of technology. The next phase was, for the West, the mechanization of the alphabet, the Gutenberg press. We know how that happened. The Renaissance put, was put on steroids with the availability of books. Modernity came to the world in 1500, and the West has dominated the world for the last 500 years. That's about the shift, the pendulum swinging, but that pendulum is only starting to swing. So, then the next step was the electrification of technology, electric motors, okay? But then the alphabet got electrified. The next stage of technology now is communications technology electrified. First stage, the telegraph. Now, my last name is Fong. If I want to send my name down the telegraph line, is the, tele the Morse code would be That's Fong down the line. But to transmit a Chinese character down the telegraph line, that's, that's insane. You can't do it. The next step was teletype, electrification of text, direct. That code became ASCII. ASCII, well, that's the basis for, te for, tele for computer communication, all right? So now the world, the alphabet became electronicized, computerized, all right? Make a long story short, the punchline of that is each stage of technology gets more and more fast in its cycle. Mm -hmm. We don't live in modernity anymore. We live in hypermodernity. And the one constant that Marshall McLuhan said, I can't predict specific technologies that will be coming, all right? And he got some, some things wrong. But he said, I can't predict the, the specific technologies, but I will tell you this, the, the world will advance faster and faster and faster. And the world will create technologies faster and faster, and more and more new technologies faster and faster. We're now beyond computers. We're in the biotech. We're in the nanotech, okay? I've been reading stuff about nanotech that have me <laughs> drop, my, my jaws just drop, okay? What's happening is our world goes faster and faster. Modernity becomes hypermodernity. Proof of that would be is the, new, the news headlines on your, uh, say, noon news can be totally different from your headlines on your evening news. The world can literally change on the news cycle in about five to six hours. The world can change in five to six hours. James Burke said that great documentary, The Day of the Universe Changed. He said the day the universe changes is when you have a paradigm shift in knowledge. For you, experiencing that knowledge, the world for you has changed. The, your understanding of the world has completely changed. But the paradigm shift now is by hour, by the hour, by the day, by the week. Okay? Your universe, our universes change with every new cycle. That's the world we're living in. And my personal thing is, it's out of control. And, uh, but I'm a pessimist. Thank you. <laughs> I'll be quick. My name is uh, Kevin Lewis. You hear me all right, Kevin? I'll be presenting on October 12th. I'm actually running for mayor for the Altruist Party for the city of Chicago. Um, so how do you know I'm not crazy looking at me? Um, the, the main thing that we're approaching as a party is planning. Right? So we're trying to um, do our best to inject technology. A lot of us work in information technology. Um, to get ahead of where things are going with mobile technology and claim mobile voting as a people's concept. And like I said, it would employ each uh, of the states, would employ its own people. So you would have objectivity, maybe you might have if, if certain states are working in terms of security and, and biorecognition and things and others are not, they can adapt that technology and so forth. So we get it kind of uh, tested. Um, but in terms of, of a lot of the things I've heard today, um, I think one of the hard things is presenting how, what we know to each other. So one of the things I'm doing as a candidate is I created 12 Twitter accounts. Um, one of them is climate change, one of them is international, one of them is infrastructure education. So if you want to see articles on things like the Brain Research Project, we were pointing that out. The article is on our health Twitter account. Um, climate change, Fukushima leak is in uh, the international one. So if you want to see these articles and see all the scientific articles on climate change that we're following, anything like that, you can email us at altruistparty2012 
at gmail.com. And my last note is you can still talk to dinosaurs, all you have to do is whistle at a bird. I really have to defend the reputation of the great seer Nostradamus. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Seeing as how I wrote a science fiction book uh, regarding uh, said uh, prophet, and uh, what it involved was uh, that the Nostradamus prophecies would uh, come true in uh, bizarre ways that you wouldn't expect. And it's, indeed, that's one of the interpretations of, uh, of his work. Now, uh, he has been credited with uh, predicting a lot of things like uh, landing on the moon. Uh, well, of course, we're not sure whether that happened or not. But anyway, <laughs> Napoleon is one of the, the major um, predictions that uh, supposedly is um, uh, kind of hard to discount. However, uh, one of the predictions that he made, uh, the, the thing about Nostradamus is, of course, he did not include the dates or the years, for the most part, or even the centuries of most of these uh, predictions. Very accurate. However, some slipped through the cracks. Uh, some people suspect that he made it, had dates in, and then uh, he subtracted them out, uh, replacing them with uh, uh, little lines of poetry, um, so that uh, uh, he would be able to be. Uh, uh, he is a very vague. <laughs> predictions are very vague. That's the problem with them. But one of the major predictions was that in 1999. Uh, from the sky would come the great king of terror, uh, which could be, oh, it could have been an asteroid. I mean, asteroids have been mentioned. It could have been a comet. But um, as 1999 approached, of course, many people were worried about this prophecy, uh, since it was one of the few in which the date, um, and it was July of 1999, one of the, one of the months at least, was, was exactly predicted. Uh, so my book was about that prophecy and other prophecies that were related to it or thought to be related to it. Um, and of course the world was saved in my book um, called uh, 1999 Apocalypse Maybe because when it was published in 1997 of course um, it, you could suspect that there might be an apocalypse or there might not be so um, but uh, uh, the book of course did not become a bestseller um, somehow um, not enough people um, ran to the uh, few stores that it was in uh, and told their friends about it. Um, but uh, I managed to save the world myself single-handedly, and uh, let me explain how that happened. Um, as you know, um, in science fiction there is um, this idea of alternate universes or alternate worlds. Of course it's in a, a theory of quantum mechanics too, called the many worlds theory. But um, if we presuppose that Nostradamus really did see futures, not just one future, but some multiple futures, uh, one of the futures certainly that he could have seen would have been uh, an object striking the Earth in 1999 and destruction occurring. Uh, that would be a great king of terror. Uh, another future might have been a dictator like Saddam Hussein, who you know, avoided um, any uh, uh, serious problems with um, um, uh, weapons inspectors and somehow had like a Fu Manchu type of uh, thing going on in 1999. <laughs> so <laughs> he could have had his, 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 a giant uh, uh, um, a ship, you know, like in the, uh, science fictional Flash Gordon, you know, and yeah. he was coming from the sky. Well, anyway, all, all sorts of things could be imagined as fulfilling the prophecy of the great king of terror coming from the sky in July of 1999. Um, but um, I, I decided I would prevent um, the necessity of any of these uh, really apocalyptic um, um, uh, results of the Nostradamus prediction by fulfilling it myself. Um, I, was in a, uh, I was in a conference uh, in Minneapolis in July of 1999. Uh, this was regarding education um, and uh, uh, you, uh, uh, special ways of educating children. But uh, as a sidelight to that, um, in Minneapolis, downtown Minneapolis, they have something called the Skyway, uh, which is just a bunch of bridges between buildings, because when it's cold, you get to be able to go between the buildings without having to go out into the cold. So they call it the Skyway. Uh, well, Nostradamus frequently uses abbreviations, so uh, sky could mean Skyway, and uh, a great king of terror could be someone like me who makes jokes and uh, has all kinds of crazy uh, uh, comedic puns and whatever. So uh, I wrote on my badge, my name tag, the great king of terror, Doug Binkley. Oh. 
And so when I came out of the skyway, I was coming from the sky, fulfilling the prophecy that the great king of terror would come from the sky in July of 1999. So that was not self fulfilling Well, it was by myself, but Nostradamus must have seen the alternate future in which from the sky would come the great king of terror in Minneapolis of July 1999, Doug Binkley. So I saved you all by nudging us into this universe in which we are in, in which a comet or an asteroid did not hit the Earth or some other horrible object, uh, at, as was predicted, could happen in my book. Uh, so, uh, so we survived. We, we are in this alternate universe where nothing terrible happened in July 1999. And you can all thank me afterwards if you want. Now, uh, uh, Edgar Casey also was mentioned. Um, uh, Edgar Casey has some greatest hits, which you can examine. Um, obviously, he's a different kind of predictor than the predictors um, that are the scientific or science fictional predictors. Uh, Malachi, I think the name is, uh, who predicted the uh, names and uh, characteristics of the popes, uh, which is a very disturbing um, uh, uh, predictor of prophet um, because uh, he predicted, I think, that the current pope is going to be the last one. So well, we all hope for the pope. We all hope for the pope to live a long time. Uh, <laughs> if Malachi turns out to be correct, Drosnin, uh, the predictor uh, using the Bible code, is a fascinating case. Uh, uh, he supposedly predicted the assassination of Yitzhak Rabin. Um, this was. Uh, and, and people go back and forth about the Bible code. It's a whole other topic. We could have a big, long uh, um, thing on that at the College of Complexes. But, but Drosnin, uh, unfortunately, did predict something for the year 2012 um, that he got from the Bible code that supposed a comet, again, a comet or asteroid is always a big thing. Uh, comet would have hit the Earth in, uh, in 2012. And uh, unfortunately, even if the Mayans were expecting such a thing, it didn't actually happen in our in our universe. It might happen in an alternate universe again. Um, we know that uh, science fictional uh, authors and other futurist predictors uh, predicted uh, um, in the, as early as the 50s and 60s. I remember distinctly reading an Isaac Asimov uh, essay about uh, synthetic meat being developed, uh, and we just recently, in the last uh, month, have saw, seen that that has actually come to fruition. There is a synthetic meat, um, which um, people um, sampled uh, and discussed that it wasn't as good as real meat. Well, that was predicted too, that people <laughs> in science fiction stories that they would say that the synthetic meat wasn't as good, or you want to get the natural meat. Um, so that's a brilliant and an amazing prediction coming to fruition. Now, growing synthetic meat or maybe synthetic fish protein, uh, that might be part of uh, helping to save the world. Now, in another work of mine, uh, a play uh, uh, that was produced, uh, back in uh, 1991, um, I wrote about artificial intelligence. And uh, uh, we know that there's a, a lot of uh, speculation about the dangers of um, um, artificial intelligence, uh, um, computer programs, or cyborgs that are uh, uh, have some artificial intelligence uh, uh, related, that um, they will um, destroy humanity or take over the world. But uh, in that play that I wrote, um, Back then, I uh, tried to have a positive um, take on things rather than uh, the usual, you know, Colossus Forbin project kind of thing. And I, I speculated that a computer program that was named Socrates would, uh, by having access to all of the uh, knowledge uh, um, that humanity has collected over the, the years and all the great authors, including uh, Plato and Plato's take on Socrates and uh, the history of, uh, you know, uh, civilization from the Greeks on, that this computer program uh, would try to take on the attributes of the actual Socrates um, who was uh, um, subjected to um, uh, committing suicide and taking the hemlock in the interest of truth. So and that Socrates was also killed by society, but um, that Socrates in my play uh, lives on in the uh, many, many uh, computer um, viruses or descendants of the uh, artificial intelligence Socrates. So, uh, so in that in that future that I envisioned, which probably would be around this time, because um, it was uh, I thought of it in 1991 as being approximately 20 years in the future of, of that time, um, we are just about coming to the point where we are close to having artificial intelligence. So uh, the world is uh, kind of poised on on that uh, cusp of 
whether um, artificial intelligence is going to assist us or if it is going to be destructive to us. And I hope that it will be uh, constructive. Thank you. If we have any more speakers tonight, yes. come on up. Jesus coming. That's your little senpai. Welcome, Jesus, in you your heart. Jesus is going to come. That's back right, in 1999, <laughs> I saved the world by praying that the January 1st of 2000 would not be the end of humanity. Although there were many predictions that it would be. Yes, when we hit 2000, all our uh, internet did not collapse and uh, the world was saved. And uh, we owe it to the prayers of, of those who uh, foresaw this terrible disaster and stopped it. All right. Uh, I think that it's time that we heard from our futurist. Speaker. Robert Jean. That was a lot of material thrown out there. I know, uh, well, this one problem with five-year plans, I think, uh, <laughs> I put that in there partly because actually they are plans, but when you go out five years, you're talking about uh, the future. Uh, and, uh, and they often miss the marks, but I mean, that was, uh, well, it's a kind of, and usually they're based on extrapolation, and that's probably the weakest form of, of trying to predict the future. Although sometimes it turns out to be fairly accurate. You start a trend, and like, uh, anyway, um, there's another thing going on. You were talking about uh, as countries become more affluent, the Hello? population goes down. There's another trend going on in the United States is more and more women are choosing to remain childless. Yes. And they married or unmarried. Right. So there's a big, there's a, because it's not only the cost, it's a, it's a, to raise a child is a very demanding. Mm -hmm. And it, uh, so uh, as, I, as I realize now my son, my son has two, little girls and he's always taking him here or there. I mean, he, he has no time for himself, hardly, you know, beside his work, you know. But he loves him to death, doesn't yeah, he? Yeah, he does. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so anyway, uh, well, I, I enjoyed hearing all your remarks and I know that, uh, but I was going to say also in response to that one man who was very critical, Arco Santi, if you go to Phoenix, my God, they don't even have enough water. They have to water from the mountains or somewhere or the Colorado River. Uh, and, the, and there's the whole land around there. They, I don't know how they can grow anything there, you know. So how does, how does, I mean, that, that, that's the only thing I can think was how are these people, what are they doing to make a living? How are they getting, what are they doing to exchange and trade for food? But the interesting thing is that there are four or five or six big Indian reservations out there. Those people lived in that environment for thousands of years and survived. So you can do it. Not but, in the mountains, they were but, in, the, in the valleys. Yeah. These guys but, but, made but the thing, in the mountains. Ar but Arcosani would build the city so he wouldn't destroy the land. Then you could go out and, and farm the land or whatever you had to do. It's all abandoned, it's nothing there. It's on the bank of the Aquafria River. And it's, yeah, it's, it, it, he only has a hundred people there now. He never, oh, his dream was never realized. Yeah. <laughs> right. Could have been realized. Well, thank you. I don't know. Is that, I don't have many else to say unless someone wants to. Then ask. we'll close the college down tonight. Wish everybody a good night and uh, say thank you very much for attending. Thank you. Yes, we wish everybody a good night. Come again as soon as you can. And, uh, God be with you. Uh, thank you.
Thank you, Charlie.